True Crime Never Sleeps Podcast. I am your host, Larry Lees. Today we're diving into true crime and how it changed our culture. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Poddex, for sponsoring this episode. You can check them out today at poddex.com. And use the promo code Larry21 for 10% off your purchase. And as always, if you want to be a part of the show, you can send us a voicemail at 682-305-0483. You can let us know your thoughts on the topic covered, uh, any cases we should cover in the future. Let us know, and we'll feature you in an upcoming episode. And of course, if you'd like to remain anonymous, you can do that as well. And now on to our main topic. How true crime took over our culture. How true crime went from a guilty pleasure to high culture. If you're like me, there's nothing better than settling to the couch after a long day's work and flipping on the television to Investigation Discovery. Investigation Discovery, or ID, is a cable television network owned by Discovery Communications that features almost exclusively true crime documentaries, mainly murders with a sprinkling of kidnappings, stockings, stockings, excuse me, and the ever-favorite unexplained disappearance. It is the televisual mecca for fans of hard-boiled, albeit rather low-rent, crime stories. Riveting, and has become the ultimate guilty pleasure. This wasn't always the case. ID initially launched in the mid-90s as the Discovery Civilization Network, anchoring its programs in anthropological documentaries and historical reenactments. Several, several years in a failed partnership with the New York Times later, Discovery Communications hired creative studio Trollback Plus Company to rebrand the network. By 2006, what began as a stab at producing high-minded cable content has resorted to the lowest common denominator, true crime. Since the change, ID has risen through the ranks of cable entertainment to build a loyal following, particularly among women. The network rounds off its addictive programming with big name hosts like Tamron Hall, Paul Zahn, and has become a second home for NBC's Dateline. The ascent of the ID channel mirrors the deep cultural appetite for true crime media. The genre has been widely popular for decades, starting with Pulp Fiction and continuing through America's Most Wanted and Beyond. I know personally I've been hooked on true crime probably since I haven't, shouldn't have been watching it when I was a kid. Like, I always tuned in America's Most Wanted. I think partly just because the stories were real, and you know, like, all these people are walking the streets somewhere in America, or in the world in general. Beginning in the last few years, however, what was once largely the realm of low bro brow entertainment has entered high culture, become, becoming precisely the kind of cerebral content marketed to intellectual elites at the Discovery Times Partnership sought to pin down. The change in public perception of the genre was the result of several factors. In 2013, The Atlantic published Hannah Rosen's cover story, Murder by Craigslist, the chilling tale of Richard Beasley and his teenage accomplice, Brogan Rafferty, that used Craigslist ads to lure unsuspecting men to their grisly deaths. For true crime to snag the cover slot on one of the nation's most respected periodicals was a major coup. The following year, Serial, a spinoff of Chicago Public Radio's massively popular This American Life, sprang to the forefront of brainy culture. The murder of Hei Min Lee and the potentially wrongful conviction of her ex-boyfriend, Saeed, held listeners across America utterly wrapped and spawned hundreds of think pieces. It also scored host Sarah Koning a second season and likely inspired a rash of similar moves from production outfits across the media spectrum. Netflix's new hit series, Making a Murderer, spoiler alert, capitalizes on the serial phenomenon with the story of Stephen Avery, a Wisconsin man convicted of sexual assault and attempted murder of Penny Bernstein in the 1980s. Avery was exonerated in 2003, then charged with the murder of another woman, Teresa Hallback, just two years later. Making a Murderer follows the seemingly impossible events leading up to Avery's second trial and considers the idea 
The Manitowa County officials planted evidence conspiring to put Avery back behind bars. This is not the first time that the true crime genre has popped into the stratosphere of pop culture sophistication. Truman Capote's 1960s thriller In Cold Blood comes to mind, as does Vincent Bugliozzi. Bugliozzi's Helter Skelter, which covered the Manson murders and remains the biggest selling true crime book in U.S. history. Edmund Pearson, viewed by many as the man who spearheaded true crime journalism in the 1920s, published his work in prestigious publications like The New Yorker and Vanity Fair. So what happened in between true crime's already, already reputation in the mid-20th century and the genre renaissance of today? Arguably, a rise in public interest for true crime stories of social importance, a cultural obsession with glitzy, sensationalized cases, the murder of John Benet Ramsey, and the O.J. Simpson trial, for example, defined the genre in the 1980s and 90s. The newest crop of true crime entertainment is taking a different tack. Instead of fetishizing the criminal and the crime, serial and making a murderer take a long, hard look at the context in which such atrocities arise how we as a society deal with them, and whether our methods of delivering justice are as sound as they are purported to be. Serial dug deep into people's preconceived notions surrounding interracial dating, Muslim American culture, modern teen masculinity, and the pressure, pressure on law enforcement to build clean narratives around crimes, making a murderer dissect society's need to contain so-called undesirables in our communities and how righteousness and bias can completely railroad our constitutionally mandated judicial processes. True crime has often been defined by half-truths, glamorizations, stretched facts, and insinuations. Today, it's becoming more about interrogating our criminal justice system and examining our theories on criminality and law enforcement. These media-inspired discourses can produce major results. More than 15 years after his conviction, Saeed has been granted a hearing so that his lawyers might present new evidence in his favor. Following making a murderer's release, 160,000 people signed on the petitions to free Stephen Avery. Quote, I think the film does a good job of raising broader sy systemic issues that could have happened anywhere. Avery's defense attorney, Dean Strang, told the New York Daily News, we are still working for it. For for free for him informally, and I suspect it's going to get more formal soon here. And that is all we have for this episode of the True Crime Never Sleeps podcast. Let us know your thoughts on uh, true crime and its impact on culture. Are you a fan of true crime? Are you one of those that sit back and watch true crime stories on TV or streaming for hours upon hours? I know I can. I actually used, uh, what is it? I think it's Discovery Plus for true crime because they have some really good content on there. So if you're looking for new true crime stuff, check out Discovery Plus. No, I'm not sponsored by them or am I an affiliate with them? They just have great content that I enjoy watching. And if you want to support the channel, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. Your support helps the channel grow, um, bring in new hosts and writers, and actually be able to pay them. And hopefully one day take this show on the road. And as always, thank you for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time.